Good evening and welcome. We'll start off this evening just talking a little bit about Women Focus Canada. Women Focus Canada is a Canadian registered nonprofit organization. Our goal is to share best and promising practices that promote health and wellness for women, girls, and families, and communities in Canada and beyond. Women Focus Canada's mandate includes, in, includes to address gender-based violence, trauma, promote physical, mental, and psychological health, gender rights, and equality for girls and women build capacity and empower individuals to improve their lives and contribute to social, socioeconomic development in our community. This project, uh, this project targets Afro-Caribbean in, Afro in the GTA to elevate community awareness, disseminate information, to provide education about prevention, effect, the effects and risk of COVID-19, and to provide information on how to access critical services. This evening, uh, Women Focus Canada is part partnering with the Government of Canada and Community and Red Cross for this project. We'd like to welcome our speakers, Anjali Gopina, Dr. Oloshola Sukhtunde, and Martin Reed. Thank you. This series is designed specifically for Afro -Caribbean, the Afro-Caribbean community in the GTA and other communities are also welcome. The goal of this webinar is to learn about nutrition and physical health during COVID-19. And we'll just jump into our session this evening and I'll go ahead and invite our first speaker. Her name is Anjali Gokina. Anjali is a registered dietitian in Ontario, Canada, as well in the US. A little bit about Anjali. A little bit about Anjali. Anjali has a master's degree in food, nutrition, and diet. Dietics. She's a registered dietitian in Canada and the U.S., like I mentioned earlier. Anjali has, about, has had about 20 years' experience working in nutrition and promotion, consulting as a consultant for major municipalities in Ontario, Canada, which, in which Anjali has worked and focused on preventing disease, promoting health. Sorry. Anjali has focused on preventing diseases and promoting healthy lifestyles, especially for families with young children from ethno-cultural ethno communities. Sorry. Welcome, Anjali. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you for that introduction. Hi, everyone. As we start today's meeting, as we start today's meeting, I would like to state that I am a registered dietitian and affiliated with the College of Dietitians of Ontario in Canada. The information I provide today is of general nature, and it is not intended to treat, diagnose, or give specific medical advice for any specific medical condition. The content is a reflection of information mainly from Health Canada and the Center for Disease Control and Prevention in the USA, and strives to be science-based. With that being said, let's move on. Next slide. Next slide, please. So um, in today's presentation, you will get to hear what dietary guidelines are all about, understand the basics of healthy eating, apply the principles of healthy eating during the pandemic for yourself and your family, and build upon this knowledge to continue to eat healthy long after the pandemic. These are some examples of food-based dietary guidelines. The World Health Organization recommends that all countries develop and use food-based dietary guidelines. This means that countries develop healthy eating messages for their population based on commonly available and culturally appropriate foods, common eating practices and patterns of that population. These are meant to be broad guidelines so that individuals can make healthy choices to avoid diet-related non-communicable diseases such as heart disease, strokes, heart attacks, cancers, and diabetes. Countries can get pretty creative when it comes to getting that information across. Like Benin, a country in West Africa, has its food guide shaped like a thatched roof of a traditional home. Food guides from other countries may use either a fruit, a food, 
or any item that's native to their country. For example, Antigua and Barbuda, they have a food guide that looks like a pineapple. And Qatar has a gu guide line that looks like a seafood shell. Belgium and Nigeria, on the other hand, look like triangles, but oriented in opposite directions. And Sweden, true to form, think IKEA, has a minimalistic approach to its food guide. Next slide. In conclusion, although countries have their own food guides or dietary recommendations, there is a common theme. What about Canada? Canadians too ask for accurate and reliable healthy eating information, which must be evidence-based. And the Canadian food guide is relevant to all Canadians two years old and over. These are all messages of the Canada's food guide, broadly divided into healthy food choices and healthy food habits. Under healthy food choices, Canada's food guide advises us to choose a variety of foods, make water your drink of choice, use food labels, limit highly processed foods, and to be aware of how food marketing can influence our food choices. I'll talk about variety in the next slide and I'll focus a little bit about what highly processed foods mean. Our food environment is changing constantly. Highly pro oh, the previous slide, please. Highly processed foods are readily available everywhere and more and more people are choosing highly processed foods on a daily basis. Eating highly processed foods increases your intake of sodium, sugars, and saturated fats, which in turn can increase your risk for heart disease. Remember the three S's, sodium, sugars, and saturated fats. Sodium is present in common salt and in many foods as a preservative or to increase the taste. But if we eat too many of these foods, it may lead to high blood pressure, which may lead to heart disease. Sugars, on the other hand, are present in foods as well as drinks. And an increase in foods of high in sugar will lead to diabetes or obesity, and especially cavities in children. Finally, we must aim to replace foods that are mostly saturated fat and replace them with foods that have healthy fats. Healthy fats are a lot of oils that may be corn, olive, canola, sunflower, sesame, and many other oils. Many cultures have palm oil and coconut oil as well in their foods. And if we can limit a little bit of that, we are still good to go. What about food labels? Food labels can be very confusing, but if we know how to read food labels and understand them, it will help us to make healthy choices. And how about food marketing? Food marketing is advertising that promotes the sales of food. And mostly these foods and drinks have the three S's. They are either a lot of sugar in them or they may not be healthy in any other way. So we need to limit or be aware of food marketing. Food marketing takes on many forms. They can be in the form of uh, our children's sports being sponsored by food companies celebrity endorsements of food, contests, sales, and promotions, all associated with food purchases. Next slide, please. Canada's food guide has given us a very easy tool to use. It's called the Eat Well plate. It is a plate that represents how much of which portions of foods we should have. Next slide, please. So when we look at the Eat Well plate, it doesn't need to be translated into any language. It is very easy to understand. Half your plate should be filled with vegetables and fruits, mostly fresh. But sometimes if we don't get fresh fruits or vegetables, then we can choose frozen and canned as well. You might be surprised hearing this. However, it all depends on the choices of our canned and frozen fruits. For example, canned peaches. If you buy a can of peaches, then it should be in, canned in its own juices. If it is canned in syrup, then that would be added sugars. You can drain out the syrup 
rinse the fruit if possible, and then serve it. Time and again, having processed uh, foods in this way, especially where we can have a choice of draining out the liquids, we try to make healthier choices in this way. As for vegetables, let's say canned corn. It may not, corn may not be available all through the year, but we can rely on canned corn to, to add vegetables to our diet. Just drain out the liquid and that is mostly uh, salt, salted and rinse it and eat it. Well, that's as far as half the plate is concerned. One quarter of the plate should have lean meats, nuts, seeds, beans, peas, lentils, and even milk. These all foods make up protein foods. Regular people on uh, leading regular lives don't need a large portion of protein in their diets. Choosing protein foods carefully and mostly plant-based will give us fiber and unsaturated fats as compared to animal protein foods. We see that milk is also added to the protein foods. If you or your uh, or people you know cannot have milk products, then choose an unsweetened full milk alternative. Canada's dietary guidelines recommend fortified soy milk. There are many other beverages also available in the market that are uh, sold as all milk alternatives. Be careful when you choose any of those beverages because they may be sweetened and that is added sugar to your drink. The last section or the last quarter of your plate should be filled with whole grains. Next slide, please. Uh, well, can we go back to the previous slide? Thank you, Rubina. So I'll focus on whole grains. Beware of whole grains as compared to whole wheat or whole uh, whatever the name of the grain is. Whole grain means it has the full grain. It has the bran, it has the endosperm in the middle, and it has the germ. When we choose any grain products, read the label and see the ingredient list. It should say whole grain. Sometimes we think that brown bread is good, but they may just be coloring the bread with caramel and that can really throw us off. Read the label and look for whole grain. I wish I had a slide here that would show you exactly how to read food labels, but that would take a very long time. So we'll skip and we'll go on to the next slide. To put it all in practice in the next slide, these are examples of um, two healthy breakfasts and two healthy meals. You can see how half the plate is filled with vegetables in the omelet that has tomatoes and peppers and some fruits and half a bagel. The other example of a healthy breakfast is a whole grain toast with any kind of nut butter with a few slices of apple on the side and a glass of milk. Be careful when you pick up or buy nut butters. Many of them have added sugar and salt to them. However, if we are careful, we can choose 100% natural nut butters. As for meals, if you see the adult has a meal in front of him, half his plate is filled with fruits and vegetables and some rice and a glass of water. The same types of foods can be served to a young child in smaller portions, yet half his plate is also filled with vegetables and fruits. We are avoiding the water for kids here because if a child drinks water during their meals, they may fill up their tummy and it will replace eating healthy foods. Next slide, please. Now Canada's food guide is not just about choosing healthy foods we also need to have healthy food habits. And some of those habits are being mindful of, the, of your eating habits, cooking more often, enjoying your food, eating with others, and, being, and having a good relationship with food. Next slide, please. Oh, yes. 
how about cooking more often? We all know that sometimes we just really don't feel like cooking. There are a lot of healthy recipes available that are no cook recipes. Choose some because sometimes we all need a break from cooking and washing dishes. Next slide, please. Eating healthy during COVID. There are some factors that affect healthy eating, especially during these times. Many of us have experienced stress of one kind or the other, whether it is accessing healthy foods or the affordability of foods. We worry about whether the supply of food will remain as well as the safety of foods. Some of us are going through stress. Some of us are working from home, which may be convenient, but is, it can be also stressful because the family is around us. Next slide, please. There are some common questions related to food and COVID, and I thought I'd go across some of these questions. Can coronavirus be spread through food? I'm sure many of you are wondering about this. The good news is that the virus does not, um, cannot multiply in food as compared to bacteria. It is possible that the virus can get into food if someone who is infected touches, coughs, or sneezes on the food, or has the virus on their hands and touches the food. But unlike bacteria that cause foodborne illness, coronaviruses don't multiply in food. Viruses require a living host, such as a human body, to grow. How about cooking? Does cooking kill the virus? Health Canada says that coronaviruses are killed by normal cooking temperatures. This is also said by the World Health Organization. That's why you don't need to cook foods any other different way than you normally would. Just make sure that cooked foods are kept at the right temperature. Cold foods are kept really cold and hot foods are kept hot. Now, do meats and other animal products carry the virus? Just because the first cases were linked to a live animal market, it may have led some people to believe that meats and animal products carry the virus, but there's no evidence for this. According to a paper, the primary route of transmission is person to person. So we don't need to be worried about our meats and other animal products carrying the virus. Next slide, please. We must be wondering whether, cook, now that we know cooked foods are safe, do raw foods like fruits and vegetables, are they safe as well? It, theoretically, it's possible that if someone who's infected sneezes directly on an apple, you pick the apple and then touch your face, you could get infected. But you're as much more likely to get infected from this person if they were standing next to you at the apple bin. That's why social distancing is required to put at least six feet between you and this other person. You should wash your hands, sanitize your hands as soon as possible after returning from the grocery store. And if you're concerned, you can eat cooked produce instead of raw. Should you wash produce any differently? That's not necessary. Just wash fruits and vegetables in running water Use a vegetable brush if you want to be extra careful on hard produce like potatoes and apples. Don't wash produce with soap or diluted bleach because these could upset your stomach. Vinegar won't kill the virus and there's no evidence that vegetable washes do either. Next slide, please. Can you pick up the virus from food packaging? We've all wondered this. Well, we know that coronavirus is primarily transmitted from person to person. Some packaging such as um, stainless steel and um, uh, can carry the virus for up to 72 hours, but cardboard, they did not find live viruses on cardboard after 24 hours. What can you do to reduce your risk? The same thing, wash your hands when you get home from the grocery store, place your food on a surface that can be cleaned and you can wipe down glass jars and plastic tubs as well with a sanitizing wipe. 
Should you wash your reusable grocery bags? That's definitely a thing to do whether there was the pandemic happening or not. So yes, it's a good habit to wash your grocery bags. Should you be concerned about food from areas where there is a lot of uh, COVID cases? Really speaking, no, because if the food is imported from any of these places, by the time it is through transport and reaches your grocery store, the virus would have died. Next slide, please. Do you need to be worried if a worker at a store where you bought your food tested positive? Experts say this isn't necessary. Foods would need to be recalled or withdrawn from the market because an employee getting sick with COVID? Not really. Stores may need to shut down for some deep cleaning, but foods don't need to be thrown away. Should you avoid takeout or delivery from restaurants? It's a personal choice. You can ask your favorite restaurant what measures they have put in place during the pandemic. If you're satisfied, you don't need to avoid buying food from them. In fact, it may be a good alternative and can reduce the need to have contact or interact with people at a grocery store. As long as most of your meals are made at home and in a healthy manner, restaurant foods offer some relief from cooking and dishwashing once in a while. Could a sick restaurant employee contaminate your food? In general, restaurants have food safety standards that they are required to follow to avoid food getting contaminated. And therefore, food facilities these days are in fact putting in more effort in cleaning and sanitizing. So the risk is pretty low. This brings us to the end of our common questions. Next slide, please. So we talked about some of those factors that might affect us during the pandemic. Um, click please. Some of the solutions um, are, you can adjust or recreate recipes with new ingredients. You can batch cook and have food for that day and freeze some for another day. You can freeze lef leftovers Try different food combinations. Sometimes we don't find our favorite ingredient for our favorite recipe. Try to brainstorm with friends and family to see if you can substitute. A very good substitution would be replacing high saturated meats with beans, peas, or lentils. You can share and swap recipes as well. Next slide, please. Just to summarize, some of the important things to think about is proportion. Make sure the proportion on your plate is balanced in a way that half is of vegetables and fruits, a quarter with protein foods, especially plant-based proteins, and the remaining quarter with whole grain foods. Think variety. Think water as the beverage of choice with every meal as far as possible, and limit highly processed foods. Next slide, please. Well, we are at the end of our presentation and I think you might have picked up a few tips to eat healthy, whether the pandemic is on or after, long after the pandemic. Thank you so much. Thank you to Women's Focus Canada for giving me this opportunity and stay around to hear our other speakers. Thank you so much, Anjali. That was a great presentation. Good tools, sorry, good tips um, and solutions for people to eat healthy during COVID. And like you said, I'm beyond. Um, just wanted to remind you, we'll have questions at the end. So please either put your, your questions in the chat or the Q&A and at the end, stay until the end so we can answer those questions for you. I know Anjali has covered so much. We'll move right along and we're going to invite our second speaker her name is Dr. Olashola Fatunde. Uh, Dr. Olashola will talk to us this evening a little bit about optimal nutrition. Dr. Olashola will tell you a little bit about her, her background. So she's trained in nutrition and she's a dietetic professional. Over the course of her career, she's practiced as a dietitian, nutritionist, lecturer, research, and a researcher in various capacities and specialties. Welcome, Dr. Olashola.
just a minute. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. I think everyone can hear me now. Uh, good evening. Um, I'd like to say thank you to Women in Focus Canada for this opportunity and Red Cross for sponsoring this event. So I'll be speaking, and thank you so much, Anjali, for that, uh, for that uh, overview that you did. I'll be speaking uh, with the focus, uh, focusing my talk, especially for the Afro-Caribbean community. So I'll be speaking about optimal nutrition, what are the challenges, but my focus will be more on also the recommendation during and after the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, here we go. Um, my slide is hanging, so I uh, will stop sharing for a bit and see if uh, Rowena can take over from there, or I'll, I'll try again and see what, what happens. Okay. Rowena, please, can you, can you share the slides from your end? My, yeah, I'm having a problem with my slide. Okay, share. give me one second. If you just start talking and then I'll, I'll bring it up as soon okay. as I can. So thank you so much. So we all, uh, like we all know, uh, it's, not, it's no longer news that coronavirus has been a disruptor to so many things. Uh, it's, it's, it has disrupted the food systems. It has disrupted uh, the health systems. It has disrupted a lot of systems. And uh, what has been seen uh, particularly, uh, if we look at uh, some of um, the basic concept of what are the causes of food insecurity or what are the causes of malnutrition in any given community, food insecurity is one of the underlying causes of malnutrition. And um, the Canadian Health uh, Survey actually showed that while a percentage of uh, the entire population of Canada is food insecure, it is this percentage higher amongst uh, the Black community. So, uh, well, yes, this, this is higher among the Black community. This is not necessarily as a result of biology. It, it also, uh, there are so many, next slide please, uh, Rowena. There are so many uh, uh, things that are uh, that, that are responsible for this. For instance, uh, when, uh, if, for instance, about 12.4% of the entire Canadian population uh, in, in a five circle of the Canadian community health survey, while 12.4% are food insecure, over 22% of this food insecure people are blacks. So what are the barriers for optimal nutrition that uh, researchers have shown amongst like, Africans and the Caribbeans in diaspora and also which is applicable for, for us in Canada as well? Economic constraints is one of them. Intra-household income and budget control is another constraint. Availability and affordability of traditional food ingredients. So uh, it has been shown that these traditional food ingredients that people are used to, that people grew up with, uh, tend to be more expensive when people migrate to another place because uh, if they are not oftentimes re readily available at the new place where they are now. So the people that are exporting it or bringing it in or importing it, uh, I mean, uh, it's a bit more expensive to procure. Also transportation constraints. So people have, sh have said, uh, people have, of uh, African and Caribbean descent have also shown that at times when the stores that sell this food items are actually farther than where people live. And if you don't have a car because you are a new migrant and your social economic status is not high yet, you might have a challenge getting to that store to procure or to purchase what you are used to, what you know that is good and healthy for you. Also, we have perceived food and nutritional needs and also nutrition knowledge gap, which, uh, which is uh, such a beautiful thing that we are here today. We've heard Anjali speaking about what to do during COVID-19 uh, and the tips on how to handle our food items. Individual preferences and cultural factors are also one of these barriers. Acculturation and, and dietary transition. So when I say acculturation, for instance, stress uh, uh, an African, uh, a person of African or Caribbean descent might, be, might want to adhere to Canadians' traditional norms. I will, I will, I will give a, a, a somewhat funny example. So for instance, you take your meal to lunch uh, at work and then you have added what we call locust bean. So from people from West Africa know what that it means. So in my language, they call it iru. It has this distinct, peculiar smell that when your, when your colleagues at work perceive the smell, people will tend to make uh, comments. And this has made people to stop using this traditional natural food enhancers that are rich in vitamin A to cook their food because they want to uh, like adhere to, oh, oh, I don't want to bring foods that have so, such strong smell to work. So this might make per someone that would normally have cooked at home uh, to, to go out and start buying whatever is just available there, whether it's a healthy option or not. 
Time constraint is also another example. Unfamiliarity with grocery procurement patterns is also another example. Big on this deal is dietary transition. This is known to affect every individual now, even people that are, uh, uh, because as we move away from, um, as we move away from the more uh, traditional, uh, uh, traditional diets, we move more into the ultra processed diet, which uh, has been shown over time to contain too much of fat, too much of salt and too much of sugar. Next slide, please. So what can we do? What are, the, what, are the, uh, what are the solutions? What are the recommendations for this? I'll first speak about the recommendation at the, at the, um, the government level. This, uh, this, uh, this images that I have here are actually made, uh, they, they are actually images that are made in recommendation for maternal and child, uh, uh, maternal and child health during the COVID-19 period. However, this also speaks to every individual, whether pregnant or not. Uh, if, this, if the society we live in can work together to provide food insecurity interventions, then we see less of uh, malnutrition. Uh, whether where we have uh, social protect, protection programs available, we see with the re, these are uh, acts that actually been shown over time to reduce malnutrition. Process uh, providing access to healthcare, education program like that we are having tonight, providing safe and healthy community, a uh, household community environment. These are these have been known and proven over time to help reduce malnutrition, and they, they've been doing that pre-COVID uh, pandemic period. They have been tested also to be working well during this period as well. Next slide, please, Rowena. So at the individual and household level, what can we do? Angeli really went to great details about dietary, about uh, food guide, uh, Canada's food guide recommendation. And I just have it here just to speak about the need. Number one thing we can do as individuals in our households is dietary diversification. We cannot continue to eat the same kind of food every time because there is no superfood out there. Every food item has different things that it provides for the body. Next slide, please. I just, uh, I, I just chose a few slides to show us what does this, so I, I like what uh, 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 the Family Institute of Health has done, showing the kind of different, what does my healthy plates look like for different people from different places. So for a West African, uh, for someone of a West African uh, descent that could have looked at the previous one and say, what does this mean for me? When you look at this plate, you can see what this means. So this is uh, this popular jollof rice that is always causing issues amongst Nigerians and Ghanaians. Uh, so you could see that it's supposed to take just a quarter of your plate, whereby your protein takes a quarter. And then you see how the vegetable is cooked. With, you, could, you, could, you can see excess oil flowing in the plates. It's like, it's well steamed and it's it's really great. I can see some people commenting already about the jollof rice. And then these are options that you can, that there are options here whereby we can replace this rice with the healthier options. Because if someone says, oh, I have cassava, I have cassava, I, I use, I, I eat cassava meals, then you know what it's supposed, it's supposed to replace the half, what we call starch. And then like that, you pick your vegetables. Next slide, please. The, the next few slides are just to show what this uh, kind of looks like. Um, for everyone. Next slide, please. Thank you, Rowena. So uh, soul food, what, what's been known as a soul food, this, it might look like this for someone who, who prefers the soul food kind of. Next slide, please, Rowena. So this is still uh, talking about the dietary diversification. Next slide, please. Thank you. So the next one is mindful grocery shopping. Anjali spoke uh, a lot about knowing how to read food uh, labels. This is very key. This is very important. And this is important for mindful grocery shopping. Number one key point also, uh, aside uh, reading food label, don't shop while hungry. So these are major tips that look so simple. They feel so simple, but the reality is that they are very important because they affect every one of us, including myself. With all my nutrition knowledge and dietetic knowledge, if I go to the st grocery store hungry, I'm going to be looking at the soda. I'm going to be looking at the fries. I'm going to be, because your, 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 your brain is telling your, your, something is just not connecting properly. So don't shop while hungry. Make your grocery list before you go shopping. Next slide, please. The third one is to avoid intake of ultra processed foods. These have been shown over time to increase risk of overweight and obesity, 
it's, it's been shown to increase risk of higher fasting uh, glucose, increased risk of uh, metabolic syndrome, including uh, increased risk of total and uh, low density lipoprotein cholesterol, and also hypertension. And this, uh, the, com the, the, the comic, comic strip beside it, say it, it's, it, it looks funny, but is, is the truth whereby people at times, because this food are, have gone through so many uh, processes that at the end of the day, if it's supposed to be like a wheat-based meal, you realize that the wheat, the percentage of wheat that is in actually that food is really nothing. And the rest is just fat, oil, salt, sugar, and what have you. So it is important to avoid as much as possible and to reduce the intake of highly processed foods. Next slide, please. So these are tips at the individual level and household level as Africans and Car people of Caribbean descent are anywhere from wherever we are from the world or in the world, these recommendations work wonders for us. Adaptive cooking method. So especially to, to reduce oil, sugar, uh, uh, salt, and, su and, and sugar use. Uh, Anjali said something about the use of palm oil and coconut oil, which is traditional for a couple of us. So people from West Africa, a traditional oil to cook is uh, uh, palm oil. But the reality is because it is so high in saturated fats, it, it should be used in moderation. It should be used very minimally. And then we replace frying with steaming, grilling, or boiling. The, the, most of the foods that we fry do, should not be fried at all because when you're introducing the, uh, when you're adding the extra oil to it, you're just increasing the calorie content of the food and, and also setting, we're also setting up one and uh, one cell for uh, uh, risk of cardiometabolic uh, diseases. Reduce salt used in cooking and no added salt at table. The use of non-stick cookware has also been known to help reduce uh, uh, oil intake. Steaming vegetables instead of boiling them to retain the nutrients. Next slide, please. The, five, the fifth one is uh, micronutrient supplementation. So this, is, uh, this, this speaks to what, where we are right now in terms of the COVID-19 pandemic. Nutrient deficiencies adversely affect the immune system and predispose individuals to infection. There is a bilateral relationship between nutrient deficiency, immune, uh, immune system, and infection. Specific micronutrient deficiencies actually cause specific immune impairments that affect both the innate and adaptive immune system. Having said that, there is no, uh, re research has not proven that there is any micronutrients that actually cures COVID. No, this is not what we're saying. What we're saying is being micronutrient sufficient helps the body to combat, to fight infection. It's not a cure. It helps the body to, com to combat infection. So micronutrients most needed to sustain immunocompetence. This includes uh, vitamin A, D, C, D, E, and uh, folic acid, beta carotene, iron, selenium, and zinc. And I just want to say, uh, I've, I've been asked a couple of questions, and because my research background is a lot on vitamin D, that most of us of African and Caribbean descent, we are we have a lot of melanin, which actually helps us, protect us against excess sun where we came from. But where we are in a country like Canada, whereby we have less sun, and then we cannot, normally we cannot, uh, our body cannot uh, uh, metabolize, we cannot pro produce sun in particular months of the year, we, are, we oftentimes tend to be predisposed to vitamin D insufficiency or deficiency. So it is better. And, and the thing is, if myself and Rowena, for instance, if we stand in the sun, in the summer sun uh, for 15 minutes, Rowena will produce more, uh, six times more vitamin D through our skin than I will pro pro produce because my skin is meant to protect me from excess sun from where I came from. So it is important that we know what our uh, micronutrient status is actually because it is what is called, heat. this is why they call it heating hunger. Nobody can see it until it starts manifesting in the clinic. So thank you. Uh, next slide please, Rowena. And then the sixth and the last one that I'll be speaking about today is about behavior modification. So let's say, um, um, I, I've realized that I'm, I've realized that I'm, uh, I'm malnourished in whatever way that I, I and I, I want to do something about it. One of the key things to do is to is is what we call behavior modification. Number one, these are broken down into five, and this will be my last last slide. So number one is chain breaking. So you identify something that you do that you've realized that it's, it's connected to the other. For instance, you've realized that any, you sit in front of a TV when you're eating dinner, for, for example. And if care is not taken, anytime you sit and the TV is on, 
the brain sends a message to the stomach to say, uh, you, need to, you are hungry, even when you're not hungry. And then you reach for the snack, you reach for the, fry, the chips, you, you reach for the soda. You need, the, there is a conscious need to break that chain, meaning you don't eat while in front of the TV. So that after a while, the, 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 the brain gets used to the fact that you don't need to eat when you're in front of the TV. Every time the TV is on, you don't have to eat. Stimulus control. This is what is used a lot in advertisement, whereby uh, you go to a store and all the, all the candies, all the chocolates are placed right at the, at the aisle where you're going to pay. Because when you see it, you want to buy. You want to buy it. And when you buy it, when you have it at home, higher tendencies that you will eat it because you keep saying it, it's staring you in the face. So you can't store, you can't say your story like I have like six bars of, uh, of uh, chocolates in, I am a chocolate lover, so I don't buy chocolate in my house. I don't keep it in my house because if it's there, my brain will keep telling me you need to go, you just need to go to the kitchen and get something. So that is something you, you control what you do. Cognitive restructuring also, you already think about it. You already think, you don't wait until, um, you, you, you already think about, for instance, people, uh, I will say women at times or people generally, uh, if you're feeling down, you might want to reach out for a bar of chocolate, but then you know already, that is why we're also, it's so nice that uh, Martin is here also to speak to us about movement, because you know that it's just, it, it just gives few seconds of joy you can get up and go do something that will make you, that will benefit you more. So, but these things are better thought of ahead of time because if you're thinking you're going to do it in the heat of the moment, it's not going to happen. And that leads to what we call contingency management as well. So this weekend is Thanksgiving weekend. People are going to, we, we might have excess food in the house and all that. You plan it ahead. I'm not going to eat too much because the food is readily available. I'm going to process myself. I'm going to program myself. And because the thing is, when you reach for the moon, you hit the stars. Then self-monitoring as well, whereby it's been shown, if you keep a record of what you, everything that went into, that goes into your mouth for three days, you will see how, where you're eating too much or where you're eating too little. So there, I love this uh, image by very well, and that's why I put it there. There are different stages of change where we are thinking of changing. There is the pre-contemplation pre stage, which will happen tonight for a lot of a couple of a couple of people on this call. There, there is a contemplation stage whereby you're thinking, oh, okay, I need to do this. I need to, I need to change the way I eat. I need to change the way I move and stuff like that. There is the stage whereby you prepare and then you go into action. Then the maintenance is usually the, the place where it's dicey because we get tired. We get bored of it and it's like uh, it's not changing as fast as we want it to change and then there is the relapse stage when you relapse don't sit there now you know better you can move straight from the relapse stage to the action stage then you go to the maintenance so much so that the relapse gets to happen less often times than before and then when you you go faster through the other three stages and get into the action and maintenance thank you so much everyone next slide please uh yeah I, I really hope that we've, we've learned a couple of things tonight. And thank you for the opportunity once again, Women in Focus Canada. Thank you so much, Dr. Oloshoa. I'll, I'll be starting, thank you for sharing, especially the um, stages of change. I'll be starting with action, um, with my mindful grocery shopping this um, Thanksgiving weekend. So thank you so much. Um, I also wanted to say thank you to our, our participants. I'm seeing really great questions and comments in the chat. I also wanted to inform you that there is an opportunity to win a $50 um, voucher for, for Whole Foods this evening. If you continue um, just putting your questions in the chat, leaving your comments as well, just so you can check us out on Facebook. You can also comment there for an opportunity to win, but you also have to stay till the, till, till the end. So thank you and thank you, um, Dr. Osho. That was really great. So we're gonna move right along and we're gonna invite our final last but not least our uh, speaker this evening um, to share a little bit uh, with with us so our, our last our final speaker this evening um, his name is Martin Reed Martin is a movement specialist based in Mississauga Ontario his focus in, uh, is on Pilates, Pilates and his passion is introducing people to the power of that Pilates so welcome Martin thank you thank you uh, thank you so much for having me this evening. I'm so excited to be here and I've been taking so many notes listening to my friends talk about nutrition and diet and just our, our, our diet choices and um, I'll try and stay on track with that. Um, I'm going to share my screen quickly and we are going to talk about Pilates tonight. 
uh, in the same way we were talking before about uh, being uh, micronutrient conscious and being micronutrient sufficient, I think we need to be micro exercise sufficient as well. There are so many things that we can do that don't have to be massive, massive changes. They can be small pivots that are going to make a big difference in the way that we move that will help us. So uh, for those of you who answered in the survey that during this COVID quarantine time that there's been some changes and some disruptions to your natural flow of what you do, um, being in a movement industry, we recognize that. And it's funny, if you had people who teach fitness extras, fitness classes, that same quiz, they'd say that they're in better shape now because they've been doing so many online classes back to back to back and it, we're getting tired. <laughs> so um, it's a, a different, <clears throat> excuse me, a different mindset. But what I'd like to talk to you all about tonight is what uh, a gentleman by the name of Joseph Plyde's invented many years ago, just back around the turn of the century. And even before I get into it, the, the really interesting thing about Joseph Plyde's and this, this system of exercise called Contrology is that it was developed around the time of the Spanish flu. And during that time, we we're going through similar incidences as we are now where there was a pandemic and people were scared and they were recognizing that people who were exercising, who were taking care of their respiratory system, improving their breathing and their posture and those things were the people who were healthiest, who were staving off the uh, disease and the virus and those who were covering the fastest. So Joseph Plies was really on his platform during that time to say, this is something that is a game changer. This is something that really does help. And this is what our nation needs. So you'll see that I'm really passionate about this. And even though I've worked in, in working with athletes and doing a lot of personal training, that I've shifted my gaze towards Pilates because I realize that it is portable, it is accessible, it is something you can do at home. It is something that you don't need a lot of equipment for, even though there is a lot of equipment that has been developed for it to aid in the movements. Everything brings you back to exactly what was, uh, how it was designed to do. So here is a quick video that I'm going to just play in the background while I'm talking for a moment. Can you hear the volume as well? Okay. If you can't hear the, the volume that uh, the actual words are, that's fine. I'm not gonna run the whole thing, but I just wanna see some of the exercises. That equipment in the background is called a reformer and that helps you to move in certain ways. However, like I said, these exercises can be done without any equipment at all. So all of these exercises you can see work on improving your range of motion, improving your spinal mobility. One of the things that Joseph Plies has said is that your body is only as old as your spine is flexible. So some of these exercises do look a little bit intimidating, but there's some simple ways to do the exercises in a way. And there's some questions that are coming up about C-sections and things along those lines. I'll definitely answer those questions later as um, that is a common situation. Okay. And then it just goes on from there. So just wanted to give you a visual on it. Now this is a picture of Joseph Plotties. On the left, he is 57 years old. On the right, he is 82 years old. He was a strong proponent of being healthy and strong, not about big, bulky, bulky muscles, but about just being able to be mobile, healthy, and pain-free. He spoke a lot about other things besides 
just physical exercise, as he called this a complete exercise system. So he did spend time talking about nutrition. He talked about uh, breathing, talked about sleep, how important sleep is. He also mentioned play, how important it is to go outside in fresh air and to, and to run and to do things. Uh, Joseph Plies was a gymnast, a boxer. He studied yoga. He studied animals to see how they move and flow. And as you saw from the exercises that I demonstrated in that video, there are very natural movements that our body should be able to do unless we're hostage to sitting at a chair for our work or taking our kids through online schooling, whatever torture we have uh, going on these days. So that's, uh, that is who he was in terms of how he looked at his exercise. And the next slide is an example of one of his advertisements. He would pay for a full newspaper or magazine or like Reader's Digest uh, advertisements. If they're at 78 years old with someone jumping on his belly. Uh, I, we're not gonna have you jumping on anyone's belly tonight. I just want you to get a visual on how passionate he was about this. There is actually a letter that he wrote to President John F. Kennedy right after the United States sent out this, this statement of childhood obesity and the state of their nation in terms of health. He wrote a letter to the president saying, I have a solution. And he considered himself a director of physical culture. Physical culturist was the name that he called himself and, uh, and was writing letters. He was that passionate about this because it was so portable. And as much as it, in today's modern um, example, I'm sure some of you heard applies before and you've also heard that it's expensive and that you have to pay $100 per class and that you have to spend $30 to go to a group class. And now the group classes aren't happening because of COVID-19. When he designed this, this was your work. This wasn't his work. This wasn't your Plies teacher's work. This was your work that you worked on and got better at. So he designed it in such a way that, like he said in this, this little advertisement, in 10 sessions, you'll feel the difference. In 20 sessions, you'll see the difference. In 30 sessions, you'll have a whole new body. When he said that, what he was getting at those, in those 10 sessions, you'll feel the difference because you will feel you're a little bit more mobile or that I've had people walking out of my studio or out of an online class saying they feel taller because we spent so much time working on extension and, and their posture and all of a sudden they're not here, they're here, they're feeling taller. So you feel the difference almost instantly. In 20 sessions, you see the difference. You notice that your ribs aren't flaring out or that you're a little slimmer through your midsection or that you're walking a little bit taller. And in 30 sessions, not only will you have a new body, but people will notice that you've been doing something different. So that always is my challenge for people to just try it and to get better at it and just do a little bit more every time and you'll notice that it is making a difference in your body. Here's another quote here. When all your muscles are properly developed, you will, as a matter of course, will perform your work with minimal, with minimum effort and maximum pleasure. How many of us out here want to perform our work with minimum effort and maximum pleasure? It's a, yes, exactly, show of hands. Uh, it's funny how when you think about exercise, you think it has to be this grueling, no pain, no gain, I can't walk the next day exercise. When what I'm proposing to you is that if you could just start with a daily movement practice, you will feel better. And over time, as you dive deeper, you may feel like you need to join other classes and, and get deeper into your work. But start at the baseline, like that, that link. I'll send a link for that YouTube video. That video is a video that I send to uh, my people who do a community center class, a local class that I do. It's because after a while, people are like, this is really working. What can I do between classes to get better at this? I'm getting stuck with that leg circle. It still hurts on one side. And they start to practice on their own and they take ownership of their practice. So I made that video with its cues so that people could do the work on their own. And the other thing I wanted to highlight with this minimum effort and maximum pleasure was the things that we do, Joseph Plies designed this work so we can do it with ease. It shouldn't be effort to go play, decide to go play with your grandkids. You shouldn't be sore at the end of the day from playing with your kids. You shouldn't be limping after moving, you know, yards of soil from the front of your house to the back of your house on a weekend in May. That sort of thing should be done with ease because you're already in shape. 
So that's kind of the way that he looks at it. And that's the, those are the things that I celebrate with my clients too, where when they come back from the weekend and say, I did this all weekend and we were, we were out hiking all weekend and I'm not sore. It's like, that's what we train for. That's what you've been training for. That is your podium performance. It's not about a gold medal. It's not about winning some championship ring. That is your podium performance right there. Here are a few pictures of, of Joseph Plotties and out in the day, out back in the day, out doing classes with, you know, with men or for women. And uh, it's funny, you know, a lot of times people think Plotties was, you know, for women, designed by women. It was actually, as you know, designed by a man for men, yeah, for boxers, for gymnasts. And as he moved to the United States from Germany, he had a studio that was based right below, right above uh, a dance studio. So women got sent up because he had a physiotherapy background for injury prevention and correction to get them back onto, onto the floor as fast as possible. So that's where it got lost. So then for someone like myself, being a former athlete, former football player, that was something I recognized it really helped me. It was a game changer for me to feel more mobility in my back and to not get sore as much. So it's become my mission to get more men into Pilates and for, to get women to understand that Pilates is for everybody. It's not just for the skinny, blonde haired, six pack lady you see on a magazine cover. That's not it. It is for every body. Okay. So here are some of his principles. Concentration, precision, control, centering, breath, and flow. Those were his principles that he started to focus on. And all the exercises bring some element of these things to it. The breath is the one that made a difference during the times of the Spanish flu because people started to notice that their respiratory system was stronger. And even in today's day, a lot of times what they're saying is that, you know, with COVID-19, if you can beat it by really exercising your lungs, that does make a difference. So this is a basis for that. Here's a simple exercise that we're doing today. I'm just kidding. We're not going to do any of that stuff. Um, and here is one of his sayings. Physical fitness is the first requisite of happiness. Developing minor muscles naturally helps to strengthen the major muscles. And this is what flies in the face of a lot of exercise routines today. Um, for many of us, we feel like, well, I can't go to the gym. I can't use the lat pull 2000 machine or whatever it is that you, you think is out there. And the reality is we have these small muscles that make a big difference. Our glute mins, not the big muscles, but the small muscles that help us to rotate through the hip, for example, is an example of those muscles that we need to develop because those are the ones that we injure. When someone says they hurt their back, they didn't hurt their big back muscles. They hurt the small, small muscles in there. And those are the ones like the straw that breaks the camel's back. Those are the small muscles that are, are most susceptible to it. So if we can get strongest in our weakest links, that is when we are able to continue to prevail during this COVID time by just being strong in every plane of movement. Joseph Pilates said, uh, Contrology develops the body uniformly corrects wrong postures, restores physical vitality, invigorates the mind and elevates the spirit. I'm just checking my time here. And so I'll just fly through these real quick. So concentration by focusing on your mind body awareness, the better connection you establish with your body, the more benefits you gain from your workouts. It is better to do each exercise slowly and precisely than with incorrect form and posture. Centering. By paying attention to the muscles of the core, the Plies powerhouse, you will be able to help all your body's muscle functions and develop more efficiently. Control. In Plies, slow and steady wins the race. Control rather than intensity or repetition is the key to performing exercises correctly. All movements can be performed with precision to gain maximal benefits. Breathing, control your breath with deep exhalations as you perform these exercises. Helps to activate muscles and keep you focused. So we're breathing and working from the inside out. Precision. This practice uh, makes perfect. Proper form is essential to ensure you gain the most benefits and keep your body healthy. And lastly, flow. Each body's motion should be smooth and graceful. Try to create the grace of a dancer or a gymnast in your practice. And lastly, here are a few of the exercises, the original Pilates mat exercises as I demonstrated. 
everyone have that memorized? Good. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, there's a few of these exercises that we can do at our chair. There's variations of it. And one of the things as applies instructor that we're taught is where can we do this exercise somewhere else in the work? So if someone doesn't have a piece of equipment, they can do it somewhere else. If someone feels pain when they do it somewhere, you can do it somewhere else. So a simple example of an exercise that can be done somewhere else is the mermaid. Where would it be? Sidekick saying there's okay, the mermaid's not there. But one of the exercises that can be done is a mermaid. So I'll have everyone, you don't have to put your video on or anything, but let's just do a simple exercise as a stretch for our side. So if you're sitting in a chair, what you can do is take your left hand and place your left hand on the front edge of your chair to the outside of your leg. So as you put your hand down, hold on to your chair with one hand and then put your right hand up in the air. I'll just imagine everyone's doing it and those who are on the screen are, are with me here. First thing you'll do is take a breath in. So breathe in to reach up as tall as you can and breathe out to reach over. And then come back up. And then one more time, breathe in, reach for the ceiling and breathe out, reach over that side and feel that stretch to the whole side of your body. And I will do the same thing on the other side. So right hands holding onto the side of your chair, underside of your chair, left hands reaching up to the ceiling. Breathe in, get as tall as you can, reach the crown of your head to the ceiling. Breathe out to reach over. And come back up one more time for the day. Inhales, reach up. Exhales, lean over. All right. So that little simple exercise there is called your mermaid. And that would be something that you do sitting down on the ground. So we can take it to different places. But as you can feel from just that small movement, we're getting a big stretch to the side. We're working on our breath. We're working on our core. And if you have any questions, I'll answer them at the end of the session. And I will also forward you that little video. I do online classes as well. So if you like with our COVID being concerned about that, I want to make sure that this is accessible to everybody. And that's a way how, and I could point you to people in your area too, if you have any further questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. I like the quote in the beginning. You said your body is as old as your spine is flexible. Thank you. That was some really good information taking us back through history and also giving us something that we can do right here in our chair. So thank you so much, Martin, for sharing all that with us. Um, and thank you. Continue to post your questions and your comments in the chat as well. Follow us we're on Facebook, put comments there. You have the opportunity to win that $50 um, voucher for uh, Whole Foods this evening. And now I'd like to welcome again my colleague uh, Rowena, just, to, just so we can um, capture the poll data. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm just going to launch the exit poll. This is really helpful if you um, participate in this. So we, we know how useful this was. I certainly found it useful. I'm uh, making notes of how to change my life as we speak. Okay, so let me just launch the poll now. Um, here we go. I'm just going to give it another 30 seconds. People, I think, are still voting. Okay, I'm now going to end the poll and I'm going to share the results. And amazing job, everyone. So I, it looks like I'm not the only person who's feeling inspired. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. We still have a couple more minutes so you can get your questions in and your comments as well. You can check us out on Facebook, put your questions and comments in there. So myself and my colleague again, Rowena, we're going to go, we can alternate um, with the questions, um, your questions, questions and your comments. Um, you want to go, oh, you go first, Rowena. 
Okay, sure. Um, this is actually a question that um, it, it's, it's relevant when it comes to processed foods as well, because I know that a lot of my favorite brownies, when you buy them from the store, they're made with palm oil and the palm oil is what makes them so creamy and delicious. So what can we use as a substitute for palm oil? And whoever wants to jump in, please feel free. I, uh, Anjali mentioned uh, a couple of good oils that are uh, better uh, than a palm oil, uh, so to speak. So we have the olive oil, we have the canola oil, we have the uh, sun, sunflower oil. And yes, so those are heart healthier uh, than uh, palm oil because, because of majorly of the high saturated fats in palm oil. I know that could be heartbreaking for a couple of my West African people that are listening even for my family as well we have to do uh, a lot of substitution and we have to do trade by barter so many times to make sure that yeah so that's it. is it possible to do like a mixture of the two at least when you're sort of like transitioning absolutely absolutely yeah <laughs> <laughs> and i would always recommend that if you go cold turkey with something yeah then it's going to be hard. You're going to be disheartened. Mm -hmm. Your family will rebel against you yeah. and you'll have to find something else to do with those brownies of yours. So with <laughs> any change, with any change in a lifestyle habit, always take it slowly. Mm -hmm. And yes, the option is there to mix and lessen the saturated oil while increasing the unsaturated oil. Thank you. That's encouraging. And I, there's something I really appreciated about everyone's presentations was the humility you had in it, the way that you recognize that it's not easy, and that it's not that you, oh, you should just do this or you should just do that. It's a process. It's a transition. And we're all striving to get there. Okay, Natasha, time for you to choose your favorite question. Actually, it's, a, it would, it's kind of a follow-up to that one. So I'm going to go with the one where somebody asked, so we shouldn't fry plantain then? I want to know as well. <laughs> Anjali, do you want to go for that? Um, can <laughs> you repeat that question, Natasha? So the question someone in the chat wanted to know if it's okay to fry or how should we, how best should we eat plantain? Is it okay to fry it? Right. So it is a delicacy. It is uh, something that you can do at home. Uh, let's say if you were going to go out with your family and, and purchase something from a fast food restaurant, weigh the pros and cons of what nutrients you would get out of that plantain because plantain has some very good nutrients. It has got complex carbohydrates and there is some nutrition in it compared to fast foods that you would buy from outside. So keep it as an occasion because fried plantains really cannot be eaten as baked plantains. It's absolutely different. So what I would say is moderation. Just be conscious of how often you're having it and if you pair it with a sauce that I do know a, a, a very close friend of mine pairs it with a hot tomato sauce made at home. So you, you are trying to do the best you can. And the tomato sauce is made uh, from a combination of canned tomato paste and fresh tomatoes. What better than to balance that fried food with some homemade tomato sauce, right? So moderation is key. Balance is key. Thank you. Thank you. Again, that, that's great and, and also realistic. I appreciate that. Um, I actually have a question for Martin this time. So um, earlier on when uh, you were sharing some of the, the poses, some of the, some of the I, I'm not sure what they're called. Are they poses? Yeah, or poses or exercises, yeah. Or exercises, okay. Um, I guess I'm thinking yoga, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, she was obviously looking at the pictures and going, uh, no, no, I cannot do uh. that. <laughs> and, and she mentioned that she'd had a C-section. So, right. um, and I, I also sometimes look at these things and feel kind of intimidated. Is there a way to mm -hmm. ease yourself in? Absolutely. There is, um, all those exercises there, there's like a basic intermediate and advanced type exercises, which I, you can kind of say in quotes because if someone had a dancer background and advanced exercise may be easy for them or some, you know what I mean? Like, or if someone is a real stronger upper body, they may find an advanced exercise 
uh, difficult because they're, they're, they're stiffer. So it, there, is a, there is a bit of flexibility with it. I would recommend trying uh, an online class, getting oriented to the exercises and having someone's eyes on you to just simply understand what your body can do and, what, and answer questions because there may be an exercise that you can do, but then you feel like there's a bit of a tweak in your knee when you do it. And I could say, you know, move your foot in this way. So it's not the question the exercises are impossible to do. It's just that if you have injuries or past, uh, past injuries sort of thing, it may be wise to have someone just have their eyes on you as you're starting out before you take ownership and go on your own. Good advice. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we have a comment here. It says, great nutritional advice based on our, cult on our cultural background. Um, I believe that comment was um, to Dr. Shaw. There's, and there's a follow-up question I'll go with um, that talks about, or we're just kind of asking, maybe you are uh, one of the other speakers, uh, what are your views on a keto diet that promotes high consumption of fat? Um, I've seen that people really work for people really work um, to maintain that keto diet and they lose uh, tons of weight and they're able to uh, manage their diabetes. Um, any thoughts? So um, I, I will want Anjali to weigh in on this as well, but I will just uh, say my opinion to start with. So the keto diet, originally the classic keto diet was meant for children uh, that have epilepsy, that have been tried on every other form of um, a medication and it's not working. So it is meant to help with the epileptic, epileptic seizures and then even for some adults. So now, because of what we're doing right now, it, we, we cannot prescribe a diet for an individual because we're not looking at your, we, we don't have access to every, your background information. What often people do not know is that this friend, a friend that says, I'm on this diet and is working wonders for me, you don't have access to the whole picture of this person's uh, uh, medical background or medical, uh, what, what is going on in this person's body and why is this person, I'm, I'm assuming, let's say for the benefit of the doubt, let's say it's a, a licensed dietitian that placed this person on this diet, the person will have looked at everything about this individual, the clinical values, the blood work, the, 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 the biochemical assessment, everything. So it's, it's, it's not a general thing. Keto diet is not meant for everybody. Anjali? Thank you, Shola. And I would totally agree with what Shola said, because you need to look at every aspect of the person's life. When we talk about the Canada's food guide or dietary guidelines, they have gone far away from anything that is trendy. They want people, they want individuals to embrace changes that will last a lifetime. So from that point of view, any trend may work for a while and then something else will come along. Mm. So why not prevent yourself from going the yo-yo from one to another diet Keep yourself steady, make certain changes, make them slowly and surely and stick to them because that is the fundamental basis of a healthy lifestyle. Again, I mean, really smart advice. Thank you. I, I know I do know somebody who lost weight on a keto diet, but I know, also noticed he was eating less, just less food. <laughs> so <laughs> um, that may have been his secret. So I have a question here and it says, how long do you keep your food in the refrigerator in order to eat healthy? So basically I think what they're asking is, does it become less good for you if it's kept for a longer period of time? Mm -hmm. Different uh, foods have different life shelves. So when you go grocery, my biggest tip is don't waste food. What that means is when you come home with fresh produce, try to plan what you're going to make out of them. You can see which ones will perish more easily, use them first. Sometimes not to uh, let produce go to waste by wilting or spoiling. The plan that you have for your weekly menu will use up the ones that will perish easily. And uh, the ones that will last longer, apples last a long time in, in, the, in the vegetable bin, in the fridge. Uh, potatoes last a long time. Those kind of foods can be kept for later in the week. So the fresh herbs, the fresh produce um, should be used up first. Fresh meats should be stored properly. Maybe you want to chop them up, portion them out, 
put some in the freezer, keep some in the fridge, use the fridge uh, um, uh, food first, and then get to the freezer foods. So there are, fridge, all our refrigerators function in different capacities. So you should know what type of fridge you have. Don't overload your fridges because that decreases the capacity of the fridge to maintain that good temperature of four degrees and lower. So my general advice is plan what you shop for and consequently plan how you're gonna use it to avoid food wastage. Thank you. Great, thank you. So our next question asks, is it safe to use the microwave for healthy cooking? I'll go for this too. Microwaves were made for convenience. And it depends how much you use your microwave and for what you use your microwave. By and large, microwaves have become very sophisticated since the first time they were um, manufactured. They are safe for using um, to warm up your food. Uh, some amount of cooking can be done in microwaves. By and large, microwaves are safer for cooking. Now, there is a myth that, you know, we shouldn't stand close to the microwave or pregnant women should not stand near the microwave. Kids should not stand near the microwave. And that is from the general feeling that there are microwaves emitting out of the microwave. But like I said before, they have become very sophisticated household appliances and they can speed up warming meals. They can speed up and it's a safe way for even kids to handle a microwave. So by and large, microwaves are safe to use for warming foods and cooking foods that don't require very long cooking. The important thing to think about also is it, what kind of dish you are using in the microwave. So I would go and safely with glass dishes, styrofoams, plastics do leach out into the food. So be careful about using those often or for long um, periods of time while thawing foods or cooking foods. And I'll, I'll just like to add a t uh, another tip to the first question that Anjali addressed about uh, 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 the foods uh, being kept in the refrigerator. So if you do cooking, like a lot of us, uh, especially working women tend to do over the weekend, whereby you do large, large batches of cooking for the family, you, partition, you can portion them into small containers in the fridge. That way you bring it, you bring out one, one for the time you're going to use it. You're not reheating it over time. So it maintains its freshness. It, it maintains uh, its taste. And, and, and that way you, you, you're not, uh, you're not introducing, um, you're not making it susceptible to uh, uh, microorganisms in terms of you, you heat it, you reheat it, you take it back into the fridge. So portioning them into uh, portion sizes that will be uh, enough to eat at once is also a very great way of uh, saving our food uh, uh, items. Um, I have a question for Martin. Um, and um, so the question is, is it better or does it matter um, whether you exercise a little bit, like say you were doing Pilates, is it better to do a little bit every day or just once a week and do it for an hour or two hours or however long like is it is frequency better or is it better to do it in a more con concerted effort that's a great question there's so many different schools of thought on that and one of the trends are what they call micro bursts of exercise doing a little bit every day is it seems to have a better effect than to do one massive boat of exercise once a week okay. and you know, the other thing to consider with that is just the forming of habits Right. If, if for nothing else, if you can get your body in the habit of much like your nutrition, we get up, we go for a, you know, a 45 minute walk, listen to a podcast, we come home, we do stretches, then we start our day. That's going to be more beneficial for you than saying we're going to the gym and we're going to do all these exercises and we're going to burn 4000 oh. calories every Sunday. Oh. There's something to be said for establishing habits that I celebrate more than the bench press or the number of plies exercise they get in like just move and just carve out a habit and your body will follow with wanting more and more and more that's great advice thank you you're welcome thank you and thank you for sharing the link in the chat martin oh yes no problem yeah um, as you said welcoming people to also leave some comments for you for you there 
I don't have any more questions really um, on my side of the chat. Maybe Rowan, you have something on Facebook. But I'm wondering if we should have had, we should have done a poll. There's um, some people were talking about the Nigerian jollof and the Ghanaian jollof. So maybe we should have had a poll for which one is the best one. <laughs> Um, I don't know if you have anything on your end on Facebook, Rowena. Um, you know what? I'm just going to quickly check in. Um, Bamki, who has been watching on Facebook, just to see if there are any additional questions there. Do we have a winner? I'm just going to check and see if he has a message for me. Um, no, I'm not seeing. I'm not actually seeing a lot of activity on Facebook. So, um, oh, oh, I have a question from Baumke here. Um, is it good to bleach palm oil? Oh, it's, it's, uh, it's not healthy to bleach palm oil, especially every time. It's not healthy. I know because uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of West Africans, uh, Nigerians, we do what we call ayamashi ayamas sauce which is you have to bleach the palm oil. So it's like hydro, you, you are introducing hydrogen, so it becomes more hydrogenated and sort of like you, you're making it, you have, you're increasing the trans fats and it's not healthy. So like Anjali said, so because we, we, we are all human beings, we know these things, except we're lying to one another and say, you, you, you shouldn't do it, you can't do it. This should be things that are limited to special times. So what I do, I, I cook, I am actually, I've done it only once this year. I'm still gonna do it one more time. I limit to special occasions like someone's birthday and that is it. So it's not healthy to keep bleaching palm oil, no. Okay, thank you. I've learned a huge, huge amount um, from these presentations. Thank you so, so much for taking the time to come here. And honestly, I am coming away from this feeling like I can make changes. And I'm hoping that everyone else who's watching as well feels the same way. Like it was, this was really inspiring and really uplifting and positive. And um, yeah, I felt like you were on our you are on my side. That's a great thing to be on. Absolutely. Feel, so. <laughs> so thank you so much. So um, I'm just going to quickly wrap up by sharing a, a couple of slides. So I have one. Um, let me just pull it up, which is our social media um, links. So if anybody wishes to follow us on social media, you can find us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and we also have um, a YouTube channel where we post uh, all of our archived, all of our previous webinars. We've had a whole series of amazing webinars and everything from managing mental health to um, uh, leadership for youth. It's been really broad reaching and fascinating and just looking at every aspect of life during COVID-19 and how it impacts us as individuals. Um, so you can certainly find uh, information about all our previous webinars on our, YouTube, you can watch our previous webinars on our YouTube page and you can keep up to date and follow us on all of our social channels. And then I also want to share with you um, our upcoming webinar, which is going to be next week. It's always Tuesdays, same time, same place, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And it's entrepreneurship and managing your finances during and after COVID-19. So um, a lot of us have started um, either our own businesses or side hustles during COVID-19 just because of, you know, our finances have been a little all over the place. Um, some people have lost jobs. Some people have transitioned uh, out, out of work um, because of the times we're living through. And there's, you know, um, it's challenging being an entrepreneur. So how do you manage your finances um, when they're not coming in in a necessary, necessarily consistent way that they would be during a job. So we have some great speakers that we're really looking forward to joining next week. And uh, I hope you'll join up and uh, sign up for this upcoming webinar. Um, directly after um, this webinar is completed, you'll receive an email um, which will share information about the upcoming webinar and how to register. And you can also, of course, find out about it through our social media. And so on that note, I'm gonna hand it back over to Natasha. All right, one other thing is, we didn't actually have anybody in Canada who um, 
who commented on our Facebook page this week. And unfortunately, a Whole Foods gift voucher is not going to be useful to somebody who's overseas. So we're going to save that one, I guess, till next week. So join us next week and uh, it'll be available then. Um, and on that note, I will hand over to Natasha. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of our speakers this evening. I, like, as Rowena said, I, there's so much information, so much takeaway. And just looking back at the, the amount of the couple months of COVID that we've already been through, yet the advice I've heard is social distance, wear masks, and just in a short um, little, uh, little, little bit over an hour, you share so many tips and tools with me that I can take away. You know, I can also go back and watch the video on, on uh, Facebook, on our YouTube to show other friends that might have missed it. So thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to our session uh, next week.